All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And this has been a particularly exciting month for us. As many of our long-standing teachers will know, February, we kick out all the men and spend the entire month solely showcasing incredible women in science and exploration from across the globe. So thank you to all our teachers for coming in live and on YouTube over this incredible month, as by the end of the month, we will have done 80 broadcasts, 80 with incredible speakers from across the globe. I think 27 countries you will have broadcast from by the end. So a super, super exciting month, and thank you guys for spending part of it with us. So today we are going on a, a virtual field trip of sorts. We're gonna dive back in with Cheryl Chapman. She is at the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory, which over the past 25 years has caught over 200,000 birds in the name of science. And specifically there today, we are gonna join in in learning a bit about their Nature Hood program in partnership with Nature Canada, and of course, our main claim to fame today, we are gonna dive in with owls my favorite group of birds. I've only seen one owl in my entire life in the wild. It's one of the coolest things I ever got the chance to do. So today we're going to learn a lot about these amazing creatures, get you guys nice and inspired. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl. She's going to blow our minds. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. <laughs> thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm excited to be here and I'm so delighted to be able to explore owls with you today. So I'm assuming that you're seeing my slideshow start screen. Yeah. Is that Jesse? We're good to go. So we're going to be talking about awesome owls today and learning about their adaptations. And I'm pretty sure that the very first wild bird that any of you could identify by name was an owl. And that's because owls have very specific features that tell us um, that they're owls. So my little snowman here, right away you know he's an owl because you can see some very unique features to owls. So you can see his, his big eyes there that are forward focused. He's got a big hooked beak. He's got some sharp talons down here. These are just twigs, but they're talons or claws. He's got a big head and a flat face. And he's got that oval shape and upright posture that all predators, predator birds have. So adaptations are about survival and owls have made these adaptations in order to survive. They're predators. That means they eat other animals. But so do other birds of prey, like eagles, hawks, osprey, that sort of thing. So what do owls do that make them different and allow them to survive? Because being different in nature means surviving. Owls are nocturnal. They hunt at night. Some of them hunt during the day because they have to. Like the snowy owl up north, when it's daylight almost 24 hours, you would starve if you could only hunt at night. So owls can see very well. And they, um, it during the day, but most of them hunt at night just to share out the resources a little better. So that means they need super sensitive eyes to be able to see in near darkness. They need excellent hearing. In fact, some owls like the barn owl can hunt in total darkness just by using his ears to hear where the prey is. And they also have something you don't think about very often is specialized feathers. Owl feathers help owls at every stage of, of their, their survival efforts. And we're gonna see how that works for the owls. Now we talked about their great big eyes and we can see them here. We've got the little uh, uh, sawwet owl with his big eyes, barn owl, the barred owl and the great the little screech owl here, all these big eyes. The eyes make up about three to 5% of the body weight of an owl. So if you were an owl and say you weighed 30 kilograms or for Americans, 66 pounds, your eyeballs would weigh 900 grams or two pounds. That means your eyes would be the size of a pound of butter and sorry, weight of a pound of butter and the size of a grapefruit. So that's a very big eyeball considering what you have today in, in your head. So the eyes are packed with rods. Every, animal has cones and rods in their eyes. This helps us see uh, light and movement. So the cones are responsible for bright light and color, and the rods are responsible for movement and can see in the low light levels. So owls have loads and loads of rods and hardly any cones, which means they can see tiny movements in very low light, which is good for hunting at night, but they cannot see in color. And their eyes, in order to fit into their skull, have to be tube-shaped. 
Owls, as you can see here, already have big heads and they have to be able to fly. So they can't make the skull any bigger. So the shape of the eyeball changes in order to fit into the skull. And then as all predators, they have their eyes focused forward. If you have a pet at home and it's a predator, like a cat or a dog, you'll see its eyes are facing forward. If you have a pet at home that's a rabbit or a mouse or a gerbil, you'll see the eyes or a bird, the eyes are on the side. Same with the fish. And the other thing owls have, and a lot of night hunters have, is called eye shine. This is what gives us red eye when someone takes a picture. The light that goes into the eye is reflected inside the eye and that increases the amount of light. So owls have lots of eye shine to help them see. And there's an owl with some eye shine right there. So I'm gonna ask Jesse just to switch to, uh, to me for a moment so that we can see the field of vision that owls have, because that's important. I have a little skull here that this is not um, a, an owl, this is actually a duck, but it's an animal of prey. So its eyes are out to the side. That's where its eyes are, so that it can see all around. And this is the field of vision for an owl. Let me see if I can get him positioned here. Okay. For, sorry, for a duck. So all prey animals will look like this. They look out to the side, their head is perfectly still and they can see almost all the way around. If they have to move to look, they might give away their position and a predator would capture them. So out, uh, animals of prey have eyes on the side of their head. Where our predator, the owl, his eyes are forward focusing as I showed you. So this is where his eyes go, right in here and his eyes are forward focusing, and this is his field of vision. So let's see if I can get him positioned here so you can see him. So now his eyes are looking more forward, and this dark blue area is where the eyes overlap, and that gives you binocular vision, meaning you see with both eyes the same object, so you're seeing it from two different sides, and that gives you much, much better depth perception. That's important when you're trying to capture prey, is to know exactly where that prey is. So you can see with these forward eyes, they put a big field of binocular vision. Now the other thing with those big eyes for the poor owl is that he has to get them to stay in his head. So this is the size of the owl's eyeball. I've made it out of tinfoil and it's very big. So he needs an extra bony ring called a sclerotic ring if you need a big word for today that holds the eye into the eye socket. So there we go. That sclerotic ring helps to hold the eye in place. But that means that the poor owl can't move his eyeball. He can't roll his eyes. He can't look side to side. He has to turn his head. So everything he needs to see, he needs to turn his head in order to see it. So we'll go back to this screen, Jesse, and we'll take a look at what helps an owl see like that. So owls have very, very flexible necks. They're very nimble. So this little I uh, lost my cursor here. Let's see. There we go. This little owl over here is a northern hawk owl, and he's looking over his back. That's his tail and his wings to either side. And he's turned his head 180 degrees, and he can keep going another 90 degrees to 270 degrees. He can't go all the way around, but he can go almost all the way around. That means he has to have special veins in his neck so the blood can still go to his head while he sits with his neck twisted. And he needs special muscles to be able to make that turn. He also needs extra vertebrae in his neck, twice as many as we have, 14 of them, in order to make that turn. This little fellow, this is an owlet, he's got his head tilted more than 90 degrees. This is his tummy down here and his wings on each side. And his head should be this way but his eyes are now turned completely sideways. And our snowy owl over here has been able to shift his head right over his shoulder one way and he could come back and go over his shoulder the other way. This gives an owl a lot of movement. And again, feathers are helping. Owls have fluffy feathers that are very soft. So he can move his head around like this without making any sound. The feathers are very, very quiet when they move. And he doesn't have to move his whole body, so there's no other opportunity for uh, rustling sound of feathers moving. 
Now we said they have good hearing, so owls have excellent ears. These are not ears. These are feather tufts. And some owls have them and some owls don't have them. The owls that have them use them to help themselves hide. They use them to make themselves look fierce and express their emotions a little bit. The real ears for an owl are behind this face disc, right where these dark lines are on all the owls, underneath all those feathers is where, is where you'll find their ears. And this face disc is important too, but we'll talk about that in a moment. And their ears are not the same height. One ear is lower than the other, and that gives them 3D hearing. And one ear is slightly more forward. So when they hear a sound in one ear, they hear it just before they hear the sound in the second ear. And when they get the two sounds lined up, they know they've cued in on their prey. So they give 3D hearing. Now this facial disc, all owls have this big flat face. It's all feathers and they can move those feathers. So it acts like a radar dish or a parabolic dish for catching sound and directing it towards their ears. And they'll use that to help them hunt as well. So now we're going to watch a little owl using his hearing to position his eyes to see what's going on. So we'll watch this little video here. Let's see if I can control it from this side. This is a little northern hawk owl. You'll see how his body and head move completely differently. His head looks like it's just floating. He's trying to figure out where his eyes are locked now right on where that sound was. That was the photographer making a little sound um, to attract the owl's attention. And you saw him adjust his head to, to pinpoint that sound. And another feature for owls and adaptation is their feet. They have strong toes with big claws and or talons that's what we call them talons and these are meant for capturing prey basically they crush their prey uh, with those strong toes and um, rather than trying to worry about piercing so much with the claws the hawks have long thin claws for piercing where owls are more concerned about holding on to their prey until it dies and they have a toe called a zygodactyl toe you need a big word it's this toe right here and it moves front to back, it can change position. And then they have little grippy pads on their foot to help them hold their food and hold their perches. And they have these grooves that help them comb out their feathers because those feathers are important. They're helping them uh, survive, just like all of the other adaptations. And of course they can use their talons for carrying food as we can see here with this short eared owl. If you'd like, Jesse, I can show that foot. Um, up close so you can get a good look at it. So this is from a great horned owl, this foot. You can see how sharp those claws are and gives you an idea of size of this foot. And this is the toe that can move all the way to the back so they can get a grip on their prey. And we're gonna see that toe in action. They have lots of furry feathers. It looks like fur, but they're actually feathers. This helps to keep their leg warm but it also protects them from feisty prey that might wanna fight back and bite or scratch them as well. And it's also uh, acts as a, like feelers, which I forgot to mention on the beak, they have uh, feelers there as well. Let's switch to our next slide. So this is a little video from the Canadian Raptor Conservancy in Ontario here, and we're gonna see Oliver Oliver is going to fly in. I'll see if I can control it from this side. You can watch how his head stays still and his body moves. And now he's going to get ready. We're going to stop it to see his feet. See how his toes are opening? And that one outside toe is going to move to the back. And then when he lands, he closes his eyes to protect them and just uses his feet and his knowledge, his memory of where that prey was before he moves on. That's Oliver catching his prey. And here's this hooked beak that we've been talking about. They use it, some of them for smaller animals. They may use it to dispatch them by snapping their neck with their beak. It's not very pleasant, but that's the truth for owls. They also use that hooked beak for tearing up their prey. 
The smaller prey they eat whole, but the bigger pieces, like bigger, bigger prey, they have to uh, tear it into chunks. And they can use this bottom beak and against the top beak acts like a pair of scissors and they can slice off little bits of meat for their owlets to eat. And they can carry their prey, the smaller prey in their beaks um, if they need to. If it's bigger prey, they often have to take it apart on the ground. They don't want to stay on the ground eating for too long. It's not safe there for them. And we'll see here these little feathers around the beak. Um, those are sensitive feathers for movement, helps them know where their prey is because with those big eyes, they've got great, they're farsighted, but they cannot see very close up uh, well. So they use those feathers to help them. The other cool thing about a hooked beak is that it curves down out of the way of those powerful eyes so it doesn't block their vision. A big toucan beak out here would not be helpful. So here are these little feathers all around the beak and those slicing edges. And that downward curve that keeps the eye it's clear of the beak for seeing. And now we were talking about feathers. There's even more. We talked already about the feathers on the leg, protecting them from feisty prey and acting like feelers as well as keeping them warm. But the wing edges also have special feathers. They have these little barbs Fimbriats is the other name for them, these little hairs, and those reduce the turbulence. And some think it even changes the frequency of sound that the wings create so that we can't hear it and prey can't hear it and the owl can't hear it. So there's the fine fibers on the edge of the wing. So their prey doesn't hear the owl flying in. It's an ambush for the prey. And the owl can continue to listen to where its prey is and locate by sound because it's not hearing its own wings. That's pretty cool. Another use of the feathers is for camouflage. So here we see a little screech owl. He's got his ear tufts up. His feather markings look very much like the tree bark. And uh, he's got himself all thin and squished up so he tall posture so that he looks like a broken tree branch. That's what he's going for. And you can see owls have lots of color and markings that would allow them to camouflage into the trees where they hide. Because they're trying to rest through the day, they don't want to be found by predators. And I'll bet every one of these probably walked past an owl and not even known that they're so good at hiding. This little fellow blends in beautifully. If he would just close his eyes, he'd disappear. And in fact, as we can see with the screech owl, that's what owls do. So they find a safe spot and then they close their eyes. When they're trying to hide, they close their upper lid. When they're sleeping, they close the bottom lid. And then they have a third eyelid that's clear that goes across the eye to protect it when they're dealing with feisty prey or flying through the bushes or whatever to protect the eye and to clean the eye. So owls are pretty ma masterful at camouflage. And that's probably why Jesse's only ever seen one. He's probably walked past dozens because owls are everywhere, except Antarctica. Another thing feathers do is tell us how old a bird is. This is a teenager bird. We can tell that these two feathers and these four feathers right here are feathers for a mature bird. They're grown up feathers, but the rest of these feathers are young bird feathers. Now that's not so important to us, except at the banding lab where we're trying to decide how old a bird is, and there's the bands that we use. Um, but for other owls, knowing if a bird's mature or a juvenile helps you decide whether or not you want that bird for a mate or not. So at birds and owls see in ultraviolet light. So when we put this bird's wing under a UV light, the underside that an owl would see as it flies towards another bird, this is what the other bird would see. They would see this bright pink. And then these white feathers are the, there's the two and the four that were the adult feathers. So if this little owl were to fly towards another owl, they would know right away that this is a baby owl, a teenager owl actually. But next year, if this owl survives the winter and flies towards another owl, all these feathers will be white and that owl that he's flying towards will know that this is a mature owl and he might make a good partner because he can survive. He knows how to live at least for a year and how to hunt. And that leads us to how owls hunt. So there's the perch and pounce method which is what a lot of the forest owls do. They sit up in the trees, they watch, they listen, 
Sometimes they just listen for prey. And when they hear or see the prey, they leave their perch and head straight down and at the last minute stick their feet out right in front of their face because their face is locating the prey and grab their prey. So this is a short-eared owl, little screech owl. This is called red face and this is a barred owl. The great horned owl is another one that flies or does the perch and pounce method and they usually have shorter wings. The other method is called quartering. So this is where owls this is when we get to see them. They sit out on fence posts or low on tree branches, and then they fly out over the, the hunting range. And this is typical shape of an owl. No neck to speak of on that flat, flat face. They fly out listening and looking for prey. And you can see here he's, his body's flying, but there's his face way down here. He's probably picked up some prey in seeing it or hearing it, and he's zooming in on it. Then he'll just drop down once he's located the prey he'll just drop down and at the last minute those feet are going to come out right in front of his face and he'll land on that prey and then he's got his dinner and he's going to eat it if it's small he'll take it up into the nearest safe place to eat it whole if it's large he may have to tear it into chunks and swallow it but he is going to eat everything the bones the fur the teeth he swallows it with the meat, everything goes in. The indigestible bits are formed into a pellet. So when they swallow their food, it goes into a stomach where acid and enzymes are added and that starts to break it down. And then it goes into the gizzard. And the gizzard's a muscle that works and separates the meat and the digestibles from the indigestibles. And then it forms this pellet. And the owl has to spit that pellet up before it can eat again. And this is what a pellet looks like. This one's from a snowy owl. So you can see the bits of bone and fur and there'll be feathers in here because snowy owls eat a lot of ducks um, and other birds. But that's what an owl pellet looks like. And, and I can, um, can actually show you that same pellet if you want to switch again, Jesse, to the screen. I hope the sunlight isn't going to be too difficult to see, but there's the owl pellet. You can see those bones, there's bits of fur, and bones falling on my computer, that's good. And there's the inside of one. This is another one, you can see the furry bits that are there, and there's some feather bits at this end. So he's been eating a, quite a variety of, of things. There's the inside. You can see a big piece of bone there. I see a bit of red feather. wonder what he ate there, maybe. Some brown fur, maybe a rabbit or a squirrel. So that's what a pellet looks like. I have also a pellet. This is from the little screech owl, just the tiny wee screech owl. So that's the owl pellet. And this is the little screech owl that could spit that little pellet up. So this is a little red faced screech owl. Here's his little ear tuft. This owl is not alive. This one is freeze dried or dehydrated. There's his tiny talons. And that's the size of owl pellet that the little owl will, will give us. Okay, we can go back to the slides, Jesse. Just, uh, I think we're finished really with the slides. There we go. So I just wanted to thank you and I want to thank the Kingston Field Naturalists for providing the owl skin. So we're going to take a look at it as you ask your questions. And I want to remind you that there are lots of other interesting birds out there in your neighborhood. So get out and discover them and uh, enjoy the birds. I'm ready for questions anytime, Jesse. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Cheryl. That was amazing. Uh, so many neat demonstrations and, and so many cool things to actually bring onto the camera, which is awesome. Um, if you want <laughs> and screen share and come back and check us out. Uh, then you can see us, we can have a bit of a conversation. Uh, we've got a bunch of groups joining us in Alabama, Virginia, Ontario, and more. If you haven't let me know where you're coming in from on YouTube, please do in the chat. That'd be great to find out where everyone's tuning in from. Uh, we're gonna be taking questions there and from our live classes, which we have five live groups with us today, which is really exciting. So I'm gonna start with Mr. Boccia's group. Uh, they're joining us in Toronto as a virtual school. So Mr. Boccia, if you wanna come on in and kick us off, go for it. Perfect. Um, we're wondering what is the largest type of owl that you know of? 
The, there is an eagle, uh, fish eagle owl is the largest in the world, but the largest one we have here in Ontario um, is the, the barred owl. Jesse, I, I'm not, because I've got too much light, I can't find the <laughs> share screen. Oh, wait. There you go, keep messing with it. I, there's no real way for me to tell you how to do it when you're in what you're in, but at the very bottom of your screen, you should be able to go to Chrome and get it back to screen oh, and the Chrome. screen. Okay. Stop sharing, there we go. Stop sharing, okay. Perfect, there we go. You can see me, because I can't see you. I can see you, yes, we're all set. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you the barred owl, uh, the great gray owl, rather, he's large as owl. Now again, this is a freeze-dried owl, so he's not as handsome as he would be in real life. And he's too big, and he's having a very bad hair day here. But this gives you this idea of size. There's his big talons and his coat. Actually, if I put him sideways, you get a better sense of how big this owl is. So great gray owls weigh about two and a half pounds. They're big in length, and, they're, and they have big wingspans, but they're not the heaviest owl. The snowy owl and the great horned owl are bigger owls. And I have a snowy owl here for you to take a look at as well. And there's the snowy owl with his beautiful eyes. Hope he's not too washed out. I can't stop that sunlight. And he has very, very furry feet, as you can see. He's got very furry feet because he's up in the Arctic where it's very cold. They do come down to this area for this. This is their winter migration. They come down to here. All right, and another question? Yeah, that was great. Well, thank you, Mr. Baji, and thanks for that. Again, demonstration. That's awesome. Uh, let's head to Crestview. Miss Clagus is grade three fours. They're joining us today in Kitchener. Uh, if you guys have a question, just come on in. Take us away. Joe, come on up. Joe, he's coming. He has a question about hunting. Oh, no, right. is going to eat food. Why do they have to protect their eyes? Oh, because their eyes are a key for survival. If they lose an eye. They won't be able to hunt and they'll, they won't will they survive. So they need to protect their eyes in order to survive. So by closing their eyelids, if a, say they were to catch a, a snake that was lashing about, they could it could hurt their eyes. And so they keep their eyes closed as they come in on that prey. Their eyes are very important. Um, we should protect their eyes too. I was going to say sharks as well. A lot of creatures will close their eyes or have some sort of membrane or something to close it just before they actually take that big bite. We don't really have to do that as people because we're not attacking things that are alive and fighting back um, for the best, probably. Um, but very, very cool question, guys. All right, let's look at Miss Penfold's class. Four fives joining us in Orangeville. Uh, if you guys have one for us, come on in. Hey, guys. What's the most common kind of owl in Ontario and how can we spot them? Probably the little screech owl is the most common owl um, because it stays here all year. The great horned owl also stays here all year. And the best place to look for the little screech owl is probably in a cemetery. They like cemeteries. Um, it's quiet, there's lots of trees, there's usually rodents around for them to eat. Um, and they don't mind being close to people. And they stay fairly low in the trees, 8 to 10, 12 feet up. So that's a good place to start looking for owls. And winter's a good time. We're just coming into their breeding season. So they'll be busy looking for a mate and then looking for food for their little ones. So they'll be out and active. So that's the little screech owl, the little red one we showed you. Oh, this guy. This size. So he's just tiny. And uh, he can snuggle up against a tree. And you can see he's quite camouflaged, so he's going to be hard to, to find. And he has a, a, a relative that's the same type of bird, only he's gray in color. The gray face is even harder to spot, especially when they close their eyes. The great horned owl, I'll show you that one. I think we can agree you have the coolest living room of all time. This is very it's nice my, to drop on. It's my kitchen table. I don't know where my... Partner had his breakfast. I don't know how I can get rid of that stream of light. Oh, that's perfect. Now we can see him. Yeah, yeah. So here he is with his eyes. He's very large, but you can see, if I can get the, the light off his feathers, how camouflaged his feathers are for coloration and markings. If he snuggled up against a tree trunk, you'd be hard pressed to see him. And there are his big talons. 
Not as furry on the feet as the uh, snowy owl, even though he stays here all winter. I was wondering about the feathers on their feet because the hawks don't have that. Um, and they also stay here through the winter, but it's to protect it more from the prey because they're taking more time to kill their prey because they, they don't pierce it the way hawks do. They have to sort of sit on it till it dies by being crushed or smothered. Yeah. I, um, I, I'm going to take all this camouflage you're showing us as the, the fact that I did have not seen that many owls, but I'm going to go out and check and, and try and find them. I want to stress for our classes too. Uh, Cheryl mentioned, you know, go out and explore your own birds. A lot of our classes may know in May, we're doing our big backyard bio program, encouraging kids across Canada and the world uh, to get out, explore the local wildlife near them. And iNaturalist.org is one of the coolest sites you'll ever see. If you want to find out where all the owls have been located and seen by other naturalists uh, in your area, wherever you're joining from on this planet, uh, iNaturalist is a really cool tool to do that. And I'm happy to walk through our classes, how you can use it for that purpose. Um, with that, I want to head to Miss O'Brien's class. Their grade six is joining us in Mississauga virtually. If you want to ask a question, come on in. Hi, um, my question is, what is the name of a female owl and baby owls? Do they have a special name? The female, uh, I don't know whether she has a name. Uh, the owls, the babies are called owlets, chicks initially, and then owlets. And then once they leave the nest, there's a, a week or two where they can't fly. Um, so they crawl around on the tree branches and they're called branchers at that point. So they have three names, chick, owlet, and brancher. And then once they fly, they're an owl. And I have not heard of a name for the female other than perhaps hen, okay. which is a common name for, for birds. The, there is an interesting thing. The females are larger than the males in all birds of prey. Hmm. Um, that's called sexual dimorphism. So the females are bigger. The males have to do the hunting while she sits on the nest. So he needs to be mobile and quick to do the hunting. And she needs to have big reserves to first build the eggs and then second to survive on the nest, uh, being fed by her partner. So, um, Great. Nice. Oh, the, the light's kind of fun. You look very angelic with the light, so don't worry too much. It's fantastic. I have a big window that can't I can't close. <laughs> close off. Um, so. Let's get to our last live group for a, a question. We'll do another round in a minute and take a few from our, our bevy of questions coming in on YouTube. So let's go to Pineland Public School, Ms. Kyer's class in Burlington. Just unmute that mic and you're good to go. Yeah, all set. How do you know if an owl is a boy or a girl? Ah, uh, we can't really tell. We have to do a blood test other than size. So if we have them together, um, we can tell by size. And sometimes we can tell by weight if it's a particularly big or a particularly small male or a particularly big female, we can tell by weight. But Otherwise, we have to do a blood test. They just look so much the same, except for the snowy owl. In the snowy owl, uh, the males are more white, and the females have a lot more speckles on them. Okay. So they're a little more camouflage because they're sitting on the nest. These are good questions. Great, Great questions so far, guys. And our YouTube ones are fantastic, too, so I'm going to take a few from there. We have one from Miss McMahon's class joining us in Welland, Ontario. Uh, they want to know, how many degrees can an owl turn its head entirely? 270 degrees. I'll show you my little owl head. Here he is, my little owl. He can turn 90 degrees, 180 degrees. He's now looking over his back. And one more turn, 270 degrees. So now he's looking over here and he has to go all the way back around. And I also drew on his ear so you can see one ear here. And the other ear is, yeah, one ear here and one ear here. So there are different heights and yeah. one's further forward, further back. So 270 degrees, not all the way around, but pretty close. We don't usually prescribe like activities that classes can do, but making one of those owl balloons is one of the best things ever. I encourage every class to try that when they're I'm done. I'm glad I got to play with my balloon. <laughs> that was so cool. Uh, we should pop it with the big... Uh, Thing, the big with the talent. Okay. Yeah, we're really feeling keen at the end. Um, let's head to Miss Mears' class. They want to know uh, why do owls have such bright eyes, and not just like at night where you have the eye shine, but just in general, they seem to have really bright eyes. Is there anything to that, or is that just a trick and of the, the pictures? 
the color does vary. Some are orange, some are yellow. It's, I guess the question is why do people have brown eyes, blue eyes, gray eyes, green eyes? It's the color of the eyes. It may have something to do with picking up light, um, but the barred owl has black eyes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, really that's a really good question. Now I have to go and find out why. <laughs> I did confirm, by the way, I was looking up on, on Google. Uh, so no specific name for female owls. Hens is the only thing that's occasionally used, but it's for all birds. So you're right. There's nothing that jumps out. But if they get to be called branchers at some point, why, why need any other name? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Miss Wallach's class, they're grade twos in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Welcome in Miss Wallach's group. They want to know what hunts them and how many eggs do they lay and how often? They lay one clutch of eggs a year, most of the time, Very, um, especially uh, up here where it's a little cooler. And the same in Virginia, you have a winter. Uh, they lay, and they usually lay them early in the spring before the other birds start. That way they have lots of baby birds to feed their baby birds. Uh, they're, they're, they can lay between four and five eggs would be a lot for an owl. They don't usually have big clutches. I have heard of little owls like screech owls having upwards of nine, but that's a very big population. And who eats them? Usually they're, the little owls can be prey to bigger owls and hawks. When an owl's on the ground holding onto its prey, it could be captured by foxes, bobcats, lynx, house cats, sadly. Um, any other predators hunting could catch an owl while it's on the ground. But in the air or in a tree, it's usually another larger bird. Um, and the big owls have very few predators. Very yeah. few predators. They're, right. they're right. near the apex of being a predator. How's that? That's perfect. Um, I do quick shout out to Miss Cacciotti's class, Miss Alexander's, Miss Peltzer, Miss Tracy, all these teachers that are pouring in. I think we have like eight full classes now on YouTube, which is amazing. Um, I <laughs> I'm going to take one last question from YouTube and then go back to our live groups. So um, Libby joining us in Auburn, Alabama. She wants to know the longest uh, wingspan for owls, the range of wingspans from the tiniest to the biggest. For our smallest owl, um, I think it's, well, we're in Alabama, so you'd like that in inches. Uh, 17 inches. That's for the little northern sawwet. This little guy here. This cute little guy. His wingspan is uh, 17 inches or 42, 43 centimeters. And the great gray owl, his wings, his wingspan is 132 centimeters or 52 inches. So that's sort of the largest to the, the smallest in, in North America. Yeah. And I this, this little guy I don't think will be as far south as Alabama, but you might look at the pygmy owl or the elf owl down there to see what their wing size is for the smallest. Okay, very mm -hmm. cool. And I love that you did the conversion too. Thank you for that, Cheryl, that was great. Um, let's head back to our live classes. We've got time for four more questions. We'll whip through these, this is great. Uh, Mr. Bocci's class, come on back in for another and take us away. We are wondering what the rarest type of owl is in the world and the rarest in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Um, the rarest in Ontario. Hmm. Huge Jeopardy theme music. Let's see. Yeah, I would say probably the boreal owl is the trickiest one to spot. That's this little fellow here. He lives further north um, in the forests, evergreen forests. So he's got a speckled coat because he's hiding in dappled light. Um, and in the world, I don't know what the rarest one would be. There's so many. There's over 250 different types of owls in the world, and they're on every continent except Antarctica, because Antarctica only has very large mammals. There's nothing for owls to eat there, so they don't live there. So that's a good question. I would have to look for the rarest owl. Yeah. While, I think you're in Ontario, while you're answering Boreal in Ontario, uh, so Google, if you were to go by that, Blackiston's fish owl, which is this giant owl in like northern Russia, China, Japan area, which apparently it's, very few of. And I, I think it's also the largest owl. Yeah, so they mentioned that. So the biggest might be the rarest as well, but those are the things that are very hard to tell if you don't have really accurate reporting of species, especially in areas where it's hard to find all the creatures. Um, I mean, wolverines is a good example of a fairly large creature where we have a very small idea of how many there are because they're so hard to spot. So uh, good question, tricky one, Mr. Baccia. Uh, let's go back to Chris to you. If you guys have another one for us, come on in. Do you mute your mic and you're good to go. Oh, 
demute your mic. There you go. Um, how high can a snowy owl fly? Well, a snowy owl could fly as high as any other bird, uh, but he hasn't really got any desire to fly high. He could see his prey from up there. He's got very good eyes for that, but it's much easier for him to fly lower to the ground and capture his prey quicker rather than give the prey time to see him coming. Is a whole technique for hunting is to sneak up on them and not let them know he's coming until he's actually got a hold of them. So although he can fly high, just like any other bird, he doesn't have any desire to fly high because it doesn't serve a purpose for him, other than maybe avoiding a predator. But And also, owls, snowy owls in particular live most of the time in the tundra. They like, when they come down here to where I live, they stay closer to the shore where they can hunt out over the ice along the lake. Um, they don't come into the forests. Uh, so they're flying in areas where there's nothing high to fly over. There are no tall trees. There are no tall buildings um, in the in the tundra, so they don't have to fly high. Cool question, guys. I mean, one thing we featured on some other raptor programs in the past is falcons. So peregrine falcons is a good example of a bird that will fly very high because that is how it hunts. It dive bombs from really, really high up and hits birds on the wing. So we've covered that with the Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences if you want to check those out on our YouTube channel. All right, guys, two more questions. Let's go to Pine Lamb. There's a student patiently waiting, so unmute that mic, guys, and come on in. Oh, you just muted again. Oh, no. Uh, time. All good. There we go. Okay, go ahead, Sydney. What is the scariest animal you think in Owl. The owl? scariest owl? The scariest owl. Yeah. Or animal if you encountered. Uh, uh, the scariest owl, I'm going to stick with owls because there's so many animals, would probably be for me the great horned owl. He's pretty intimidating. He's got that fierce look with those ear tufts and his big, big eyes. He'll go after anything that moves. He doesn't matter if it's bigger. In fact, his favorite food is skunk because he can't smell anything. So he doesn't matter or doesn't mind if it smells. Um, and that's a very big animal for a bird to take that weighs, hmm, a great horned owl weighs between three and four pounds. And he'll take a skunk that probably weighs five, 10, maybe 12 pounds. Yeah, so that's a pretty brave animal. That's For me, it's a great horn owl. I've never heard of something that hunts skunks. That's very cool. How about that? Um, I've learned so much in this presentation. I'm sure you guys all have too. This is great. Uh, Miss Penfold's class, if you guys want to wrap us up with one more question, come on in. <laughs> what is an owl's favorite thing to eat? Something warm-blooded, I think. Uh, for most owls, they like rodents. Uh, the little owls, like the little sawwet owl that we saw, they will eat um, insects mostly, small rodents, voles, shrews. Uh, the bigger the owl gets, the bigger the prey they can take. There are some owls that only eat fish or prefer to only eat fish, but as soon as you make a rule for an animal, they break it and they'll eat something else. So owls will eat anything, and I think their favorite thing would be something meaty, and slow moving, that's where the skunk comes in. Um, house cats are a favorite of great horned owls as well. House cats have sort of lost their instinct to be safe outdoors, and uh, they sometimes put themselves in harm's way that way. Yeah. That is quite the story. I think you we've definitely narrowed down the scariest owl as great horned <laughs> That is very, very cool. Um, this has been so great, Carol. Um, what I want to do now is for classes that want to learn more, again, do check out the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. They're doing incredible work. You can check out their website right below me on the screen here. Um, all sorts of neat stuff going on there. If you're keen to learn more about naturehood or get your own classes outdoors in pursuit of owls and other amazing animals, Nature Canada's got a beautiful site for this that I just brought up. And of course, in May, we've got our big backyard bio nature campaign where we're connecting classrooms all over the world with one another to share and celebrate the wildlife that they discover. So that is at backyardbio.net. And of course, if you guys want to find owls near you, iNaturalist.org is the way to do that. You can find it. All the owls are close. You might not be able to find them. I've been using iNaturalist and finding where all the people have been finding owls and I've still had no luck, but I'm going to keep trying because it is as cool as Cheryl's been sharing with us today. Um, Cheryl, this is great. Is there any last message about owls you want to share with us before we wrap up for the day? I think it's really worth going out on an owl prowl. Um, we have a little um, instruction on how to do that at the Get Out Kids Club at Pat Bow, so you can look that up. But just go out in the evenings and uh, listen 
that's your best bet. Go out through the day and look for evidence of owls. Look under trees, uh, larger trees for whitewash and owl pellets. They pile up under a tree. And as the snow's melting up here, that's a good time to start finding them because they'll be coming to the surface. And once you know where an owl sits regularly, that's a good place to come back to and watch for the owl. Fantastic. Well, watch for other birds. Other little birds uh, will mob an owl. That means they, they cluster around it and they scream and shout and make all kinds of ruckus. Mm -hmm. That's usually how I find an owl when I'm out for a walk, as I hear other little birds very upset mobbing an owl, and then I'll go in that direction. And sure enough, I can find an owl. This has been great. So, so much fun. Hopefully all our classes get a chance to do this very, very soon. Um, and what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our live classes. So Crestview, Miss Penfolds, Pineland, if you guys want to join me and say a huge thank you and goodbye to Cheryl for joining us today. You are all now in the broadcast. Thank you so much, guys. And have thank a wonderful rest of your day.